Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us to this inaugural uh, session of the lecture series um, uh, hosted by Columbia University in collaboration with ACEC New York, uh, AIA New York, ASCE, CMAA New York, ENR, and the National Academy of Construction. I know that we have Wayne Crew from the National Academy of Construction uh, uh, joining us, so I just want to thank him uh, and the organization for um, uh, their support. I also want uh, to thank Kim Yao from uh, AI New York for also their support. And we have an interesting talk uh, today um, that we are very excited about it. Uh, we have several um, people um, uh, that uh, are going to be uh, part of this. Uh, the other one is uh, Dick Anderson, uh, the uh, President Emeritus of the New York Building Congress and Chairman of uh, R.T. Uh, Anderson Associates, um, who's going to be a co-moderator for this talk. And we have Tom Foley, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Public Buildings of the Department of Design and Construction in New York City who's going to be talking about some of the experiences that he has had um, uh, and the organization and his group has had uh, with uh, COVID-19 and the effect that it has on the capital project that the city undertaking. Um, Tom leads uh, a, a group of almost uh, 400 people uh, with that leads uh, 800 projects um, all over over the city, uh, looking at the cultural centers, the police stations, the fire stations, the courts, uh, the libraries, um, the sanitation garage, and you name it. He's uh, running around uh, interfacing with over 26 um, uh, partner agencies um, that support uh, the work for all the city and all the services that the city offers. So with that, Without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to Tom. Tom, welcome uh, to be here and thank you for joining us and sharing with us your knowledge and your experience with this uh, pandemic and the impact that it has had and all in your organizations but all over um, the city, the state, the country and the world. So thank you, Tom. And, uh, and thank you, Finoski. Thank you very much to Columbia University and the others that, um, that, are, um, that are here today for a very, uh, hopefully a very robust discussion. And, um, you know, just to um, wanted to provide an overview um, because I know there's such a, a broad team um, that we have participating in, um, in this inaugural um, Zoom, right? And Zoom challenge. Um, and as far as give an overview, as far as uh, public buildings and what we do and um, and I know that you'll have uh, certainly the honor of, um, of uh, my counterpart and friend, our friend, Eric McFarland here next week, um, give an overview of the infrastructure program and some interesting, really, really interesting things going on there. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll get started. And the, uh, as far as the, uh, the agenda for today, we'll give an overview of our public buildings uh, portfolio, our capital projects, uh, give an overview as far as where we are with our borough-based jails and, and, and all these we'll be discussing in relative to, um, you know, life before March 7th and, and life after. Uh, Project Excellence, some of the things that we've been working on um, with, uh, with obviously Commissioner Peña Mora and then uh, with Commissioner Grillo now with Lorraine, uh, the pause in March, um, some of the emergency projects and programs that we've been embarking on since March, really exciting uh, programs in, in, in an effort to um, have New York to return to some sense of normalcy. Um, and, then, and then some of the lessons learned as far as what we've learned um, within public buildings or at DDC from working remotely. And then also what are some of the steps that we're doing um, in light of the uh, pandemic and, and some of the things that um, from an engineering and, and design standpoint. So um, before we, this was a picture of me in, in March uh, before, um, before we started using <laughs> Zoom and Teams and the stress of trying to figure out new technology, so um, I, I took out my e I took out my earring and I put in my uh, my iPod. So we're all set for that. So um, 
But the what so, a transformation, Tom! What a transformation! <laughs> yes, it was like it was like a picture of Lincoln during this during the Civil War, as far as you could see how how he aged over the course of of. Uh, so this was our own little Gettysburg. So, um, but we are uh, we uh, have we um, we have an amazing team at Public Buildings. We have over four hundred and fifty um, amazing staff members from a huge and uh, diverse background. Uh, we have four hundred and ninety active projects, twenty eight sponsors that are touch base on in the value of over 15 billion dollars this uh, picture was taken at the rooftop of uh, Queens uh, library uh, over at Hunter's Point um, which was uh, which was opened up and obviously uh, was was uh, following that very closely with uh, Commissioner Peña Mora um, and while uh, and, and the great team that we have here and we had a lot of lessons learned and things like that that we brought in from a design standpoint and construction um, and bringing out our teams to some of these really, really interesting projects. Um, as far as um, you know, some of our um, our portfolio and um, and some of our our sponsors, um, we have. Well, this is our mission statement. As far as um, you know, best in the class infrastructure on time, our budget. Um, very wordy, you know, but we do build the city. But this is the DDC mission one. Um, and as far as the agency, but we have our own. Um, and this is our, you know, we build cool stuff. You could say stuff, you could say other things, but um, this is something that we had, uh, we created ourselves and, uh, and I think it's really fitting that if you asked any of our 450 uh, professionals within public buildings, everybody seems to know our, our own mission statement. Um, and before the chaos ensued, we would have our, um, every, every other Monday or so, we'd have our coffee hour and we'd be able to then congregate um, uh, it seems like a world ago that we were able to congregate and kind of chat um, in a very informal way um, as far as some of the challenges that we were working on for that day, for that week, um, and really try to reset our teams um, into, um, you know, into these things. And, and we've been trying to do that now. Um, we have our own, you know, we have our own remote coffee hour. Um, but we try to then, you know, do that through other platforms. Um, and obviously it's very easy to do that when you're at the main office and you say, you know, free coffee, free cookies, and everybody kind of gravitates towards my office. Um, but, and it, but it's important to still to continue those discussions um, because there are a lot of lessons learned, um, certainly in an emergency situation, work goes on 24 seven. Um, and it's important for us to check in as certainly as a, as a division, as an agency and, 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 and as a city as well. Um, as uh, Finjoski Penyamora had, had mentioned, we have uh, within public buildings, we have a large number of uh, sponsor agencies that we work with um, and really, really diverse program. Um, and that's what makes it so interesting. Um, and that's why we're able to really draw in amazing staff and then also within the industry from you know uh from building congress acec ASCE, um and uh, obviously aia everybody kind of coming together um because it's such a diverse um and balanced portfolio from you know everything from fire stations to shooting ranges for police corrections to uh cultural uh centers dhs um parks and you know it can go on and on but really and we tried to pick out a couple of uh, snapshots of our, some of our recent projects that we have uh, completed. Um, you could see here from uh, maybe, I don't know, 10, 20,000 feet as far as um, a snapshot of the city. And it's, it's uh, well represented from uh, the number of projects, over 4,000 projects valued over $20 billion. And these are one of the slides that I love because it really gives a depiction of, of the amount, immense work and, 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 and impact that our capital program has. It's one of the largest in the country um, and fully funded and, and bonds and what have you. We can get into some of that as, as well later um, as far as what this, what this in essence, what this pause means for the industry and, and our expectations for bouncing back. And New York obviously will bounce back. Um, we're expecting that. What, what better way than to invest in our, in our, um, in our public projects and in our infrastructure um, and, um, and we could see certainly what those, um, what the, what the libraries and some of those things represent now, um, as far as community center and not obviously, you know, for books and things like that, but so many other services that are provided, um, there. So, um, just a, a great depiction of, of, uh, of our work, um, from the South shores of Staten Island all the way up to the Northern sections of, of the Bronx.
Um, some of our um, speaking of diverse projects and diverse communities, Elmhurst Community Library, and had the uh, the privilege of of um, of attending the the ribbon cutting with uh, Commissioner Pena Mora, and um, and I was amazed. It was one of the first. I grew up on uh, in Brooklyn and Staten Island, and there was never a line going into uh, my library. Um, and it was a dark and dreary place. Um, I remember specifically that there was, uh, that there was always, uh, even in the middle of uh, summer, that it was a freezing library. It seemed like the, the roof was always leaking or maybe it was the air conditioning unit. I don't know, but, um, and uh, very cold and uh, it wasn't certainly wasn't engaging. Um, and it was simply for getting a book and getting the hell out of Dodge. Um, whereas, um, you know, going into some of the, our new uh, and, and programs that we've been working with and partnering with our various library units. Um, and it was a pretty amazing when to go into ribbon cutting here. It was a huge line um, and, and continues to have that, obviously, in, uh, up until March um, for the El Elmhurst Community Library. And uh, what this represents for the community, there was over 50 languages spoken within something like three to five miles of this of the library. So um, very, very interesting. I'm not sure where our lines came from there, but my apologies. I'm not, you know, um, anyway, so um, I'm not doodling there. I'm not sure where that's coming from, if that's on your screens as well. But uh, learning experience for all of us. So this is our 40th precinct. Uh, we're currently, it's uh, uh, designed by BIG. Uh, Dobco is our, is our contractor. And uh, we're um, hot and heavy in with that during our, um, during our, uh, in our construction. Um, and then even something like this, as far as this was obviously a critical project for New York public, uh, New York police department. Uh, we wanted the, uh, but you know, it didn't meet the, the, you know, the quote unquote essentials. There's some concerns as far as um, working out there in, in some of these confined areas when we're doing the, uh, the footings and things like that. Um, we uh, making great progress on the construction end from a design that is um, right at the entrance, there's a separate community room. Um, and then what that represents um, going forward, they'll be having, obviously having the discussions with police and for the community. Um, we're also working around the block and um, at Crossroads, um, which is a juvenile facility and deemed essential. And we continue to do really, really important work there seven days a week. Um, but we hope to then start up work over at the 40th precinct um, as soon as we're um, permitted to, once obviously testing improves and things like that. Um, that we can get back out there and start up our construction. Our fire department rescue too, um, a great project with Studio Gang uh, is, the, uh, is the architect and um, it was supposed to have a, um, actually was supposed to have our, uh, our opening in March with the mayor um, and obviously that, um, that has shifted. Um, however, the facility is opened, uh, geothermal, we have solar, um, and it is a great, great amenity to the, uh, to the community. Um, really, really interesting design, a lot of prefab sections. Um, and then some of these things, uh, whether it's with the prefab or modular, some of these things we're really looking into as well in, in, in the post-COVID um, world as far as um, some of the factories that we've recently um, uh, visited. Um, we went to several up in the Bronx on, on Friday for um, temporary modular structures for within testing centers and things like that, um, part of our emergency work um, to see how quickly we could install these modular units for testing and for with DOH um, and really positive results. Um, and some of these things that if they're working during an emergency uh, crisis such as this, that we um, and we could have things um, built and manufactured within 72 hours, just imagine what this would look like um, back when we're in some sense of normalcy um, after, after we've addressed this pandemic. Uh, Staten Island 13 Borough Garage, uh, Ten Architectos uh, is, is the designer. We have Gilbane as our construction manager. Um, and some of the things that we're looking to do, and uh, we started obviously with uh, Commissioner Peña Moore, is to bring our CMs on board during the um, during the design process to really help us with uh, with constructability with budget um, with schedule really really important um, and one of the successes that a number of the successes that we've had when we're doing that is is that we're uh, we're actually we're building to a budget 
we're building to and designing to a number um, uh, as which, which represents our funding. So this is a really critical uh, project for, um, for our colleagues in sanitation. This is located over on the, towards the south shore of Staten Island, the north side of the landfill. Um, I was over at this site yesterday. This is a deemed essential site. There's three packages that had gone out. Um, the second one was an infrastructure, which is where we're doing some micro tunneling over the highway on the far side of the screen. Um, that's over on a state highway where we're crossing that. And um, the, the bids came in uh, under budget um, for all three phases of this. And that was a lot of really because of that collab, the, collab the true collaboration that we have with our construction manager, um, with our designer. Um, and, our, our, and our end user. So making sure that everybody is on page um, with what the expectations are for the project um, to make sure that, um, you know, that it could progress. And some of the things that, and while we're out working on some of these essential projects, what's really critical is um, obviously that we're, um, that we're maintaining social distancing, that we're working on real-time delivery um, and times associated with that. We don't want bottlenecks. Um, we're also monitoring um, when people come onto the site. Um, we haven't gotten to the stage yet for our essential projects as far as temperature and things like this. Um, however, I think that that's something that we will be doing um, when we're certainly as we're entering into buildings and things like that when we're doing rehabilitation work. Um, right now, uh, any of our deemed essential projects, we, um, we have uh, about a dozen essential projects that are going on now besides the emergency work um, where it's, it's out in the open, it's tied into the infrastructure or there's large projects such as the, uh, the Croton work above the reservoir. Um, it's a $100 million, $85 million project up there and it's a very large area. Um, and we've been, um, the contractors have been working very, very well with obviously no, no problem with uh, deliveries or anything like that, simply because the roads have been so, so quiet. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we're facing now. Um, and then how we anticipate that when we do return to work, what are some of the protocols that we're gonna establish? And I'll, I'll touch on some of those later in this, um, in, the, uh, in the presentation. Um, and one of our, and we also, also completed on 91st Street uh, Marine Transfer Station. Um, I think Peña Mora was probably, uh, the commissioner was here probably more than he was at home when he was uh, visiting, but very, uh, when he was, uh, when he was visiting the site. So, um, but, uh, but a great, great project um, and, a, and a really a great team there. Um, and we had the, uh, the, the ribbon cutting there um, and uh, amazing, amazing facility. Um, and it's something that um, in, in essence flies underneath the radar um, while, while you have the amazing design, um, fully functional facility. Um, and it really ties into, again, that collaboration with the designer, with the end user. Um, and with our, with our team that, um, that spent you know, some you know, uh, two years on site um, again, a very, very large project. And, and it kind of gives a, a, a scope of the, the type of projects that, that we do at DDC um, and that we will continue to do. Um, our Manhattan District 125 garage, um, uh, the um, um, Datner was our designer and salt shed and um, very famous, you know, holding fashion shows and all that. Who would have thought of having a fashion show inside a salt garage? But yes, it does happen, and uh, and only in New York, right? So this is uh, another um, another great project that we're working with our with our colleagues, uh, um, in our borough-based jails. Um, a huge uh, program, eight point seven billion dollars, um, where we have the um, the the obviously the closure of Rikers. We have um, four. Um, we were uh, the ability through um, through the governor's office. Through, um, through the legislation from a year and a half ago, um, as far as um, being able to utilize design build for this um, really critical program. The, um, the, the where, where we stand now is that we've released, um, we've released uh, an anticipation of the four new facilities, one in, uh, one in Queens, um, uh, where there's an existing parking lot. We released an RFQ for um, a five-story structure for elevated parking 
um, and that RFQ was, uh, that was released. Um, we have a shortlisted firms for the RFP. We, um, we engaged with the firms and uh, really had positive discussions with them. And this is recently within the last two, three weeks. Um, and it really points to the resiliency of the, the New York market. Um, whereas we have, we didn't know the firms themselves that they would say, you know what, we want to take a pause on this for four months, six months. We're not sure about supplies. We're not sure about insurance and bonding and all that. Um, and it really was um, quite, um, it was uh, quite uplifting of having these discussions within the firms um, because they've always, they've uh, engaged with their vendors um, to determine, you know, where they are with the supplies, the, their teams, their estimators, their, you know, the trades and all that. So, um, so that is, uh, that remains on. We, we put up, we had a pause with our, our, um, our, our uh, construction management team, um, more of like the owner's rep. Um, we put a pause on that for um, when we put a pause on our design contracts and our construction, you know, non-essential in March, uh, we're hoping to then re-engage this as soon as possible. And a lot of these um, these things are being taken up internally with our um, in our in-house staff of engineers and architects to really try to push the program um, and making sure that we're meeting um, you know some of the things that came up on our uh, when DDC we had our budget meeting via Zoom um, and um, one of the a lot of a lot of questions regarding the borough based jails program. Um, that it is simply a pause um, and that we're, um, we're doing a lot of things internally and in-house and using our resources so that way we, uh, we don't skip a beat and that way we can go back and remain on schedule with some semblance of the same um, once we know that we can go back out there and start up. And then obviously we have the, uh, the RFQ for the, uh, the Queens Garage. We also have one for the Brooklyn Dismantle. And we also sent out, or we'll be sending out the RFQ for the, uh, the first of the four uh, facilities to be built, um, which is Manhattan. Um, so very, very exciting, uh, broad program again, does, you know, it's, it's, um, there's, there's a number of challenges out there from, um, certainly within a $8.7 billion program here. Um, but some of those seem representative of a $10 million library or $20 million library, but it's really through um, our, our industry that we're able to tackle some of these challenges from a design standpoint and construction um, and, uh, and the outreach and, and how obviously how important that is. Um, so project excellence, if I could just uh, touch on some of that for a bit, as far as um, we wanna make sure that we're deliver, that we continue to deliver projects that are enduring, practical, constructible, and cost sensitive. And these are, you know, these are uh, very important um, points that are brought out um, when the Commissioner Grillo had, um, had brought out the, uh, the blueprint for construction excellence. Um, and we want to make sure that, um, that we're able to utilize some of the tools that um, the School Construction Authority has um, and some of those things she was able to, uh, to bring to the table and to work with the controller's office to register contingency in our construction contracts so that way our vendors are not then waiting for you know, 12 months for a change order to be registered. Um, so it was always a challenge with that. Um, and then um, we use some of her contracts and obviously there's, you know, that takes time you know, as far as um, working with um, Corp Council, working with the controller's office and others um, to make sure that, um, that we're able to effectively do that as a city agency. Um, and we've had a lot of success when we're identifying these pilot programs um, where we're able to, um, to really in, uh, include that um, as part of the budget for the project. There's always contingency that is, uh, that's you know, identified, you know, 10% or so for construction but just to tap into those, those that aren't familiar with the process, for us to tap into those, uh, those costs, uh, it takes time. Here, they're already registered. There's a line item in the, in the contract for that. Um, so that way, if a field condition arises um, in the, obviously in the field while work is gone ongoing, um, our teams that are out there will uh, work with the contractor immediately uh, make sure that that work uh, continues as we continue as we negotiate with the contractor, so they are not losing any time at all. 
um, and it creates that partnership. So what I tell our teams is that we do not need design build in order to have a part, to build that partnership, which is so, so critical. Um, that on a lot of projects, we have to pretend we have design build and obviously it's a different process, but the mentality remains the same. Uh, it needs to remain the same of us partnering in with the, with the architects, with our engineers, um, and with our general contractors to make sure that we are in alignment. And we as in the city have a responsibility of doing that. We can't be going out and hitting somebody over the head about page 450 on a spec book. Um, we really have to partner with them because inevitably things change. And we know that in New York, things always change. Um, and that's why we're here. Um, but anyway, so some, some of the points there and, and some of the things that we're moving on going forward. And this is a little snapshot, a visual. Uh, it's like a little rainbow of uh, some of our work uh, over at East Elmhurst Library. Um, very interesting project, our Manhattan Shelter, uh, St Staten Island um, South Shore Little League. Yes, we were actually building a uh, Little League, right? Um, $6 million project in the South Shore of Staten Island, beautiful facility. Our um, 116 precinct, again, where we partnered with Jacobs, working with that. And our, um, and um, really had separate um, cost estimates that are opened up at various points during design to really check on, to really check on the, the schedule, the durations, um, and uh, really, really important. And some of the things that we started to do is to really reduce our design durations. And in fact, we've, um, before all this happened, we, we've, we've cut them in half um, and have really had um, positive results in with the industry and a number of meetings at AIA with Ben and his team. Um, and it really, um, and, and it's something that they've been extremely supportive of. Um, the designs are only good so much as, you know, that they need to be implemented, they need to be built. Um, and, um, and it's been a, a great experience in working with the, with the industry and on our teams of architects that we have on, our, on calls. Um, because what we need to do as, as city officials is to you know, what I say is to shred the bureaucracy with a chainsaw whenever we can. Um, and this is certainly a case where we could try to um, certainly move a lot of our designs, move our construction. So that way you could see all these buildings um, return, um, you know, and be implemented into the community, which is why they're there. You know, Kew, Kew Gardens Library, East Elmhurst again. Um, top of the Snug Harbor Cultural Center. I was actually at that site yesterday. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's on pause now, but really looking forward to that. Um, it's come out of the ground, huge uh, foundation work and everything else. Um, but that, what that means to the community, you know, the buildings are closed. There's no active construction at Snug Harbor, but um, everybody was using that space yesterday um, for walks and for, um, you know, fresh air and things like that, which is so, so important. Um, obviously maintaining the social distancing. So I wasn't an ambassador, but I guess I could be as a city official going out there and making sure I spread people apart the six feet. Um, so um, anyway, so then Rescue 2, which we spoke about, Far Rockaway Library, which, uh, which we're making great, great progress for in a construction standpoint. Um, Snowheda Design, uh, EW Hal is a contractor managing that in-house with our in own in-house engineers and all that stuff, super interesting. Uh, Westchester Square um, on the uh, top right and, the, and uh, Chelsea Health Clinic, um, which we uh, had worked with, uh, again, Commissioner Pena Mora, great project there. Um, and we're actually working there right now, uh, modifying that facility for our DAOH. Uh, we're doing a number of um, uh, evaluating over 300 sites for Department of Health um, with uh, future testing. So a lot of the emergency stuff that we're involved with. Uh, bomb shelter, um, another one um, that we're working up at Rodman's Neck. Um, Smith Miller Hawkinson working with us and, uh, and our uh, construction manager Jacobs there as well. So um, things have changed. Obviously, March 7th, uh, the, uh, the governor had indicated, uh, declared a state of emergency. Um, <clears throat> once the, we've been going through as an agency, we've been going through a number of these uh, of um, test runs as far as peak, uh, staff working remotely. Um, what we did, what I, what I don't think any of us expected was that, you know, within, um, within the five days is that we would have uh, our, most of our team working remotely. And we were able to, you know, from a, from a Saturday morning until a Sunday night, we were able to ensure that 
over 85% of our staff was working remotely and effectively working remotely, that, um, that they had everything that they needed um, as far as files. We had our, you know, what we call our OneDrive all set up, all our, our, all our file, files downloaded, um, that we're able to get access into the city's network um, all, you know, and there was, you know, there's challenges with that. Um, and, but a lot of that was thankfully addressed by, um, by March 16th, by that Monday. And it was, uh, pretty amazing how quickly things shifted. Um, we had tried teams one or two times, um, you know, that weekend. Um, and then every day we were, you know, full throttle as far as, you know, working on teams, zoom, things like that. So, um, and not only, you know, not only us as in DDC, but then others that we were partnering with for, you know, we were, um, at that point, we would still had our design contracts going. We had our, um, uh, all our construction, we had 168 active construction projects. Um, and one of the things that, um, and then also we have our, you know, quarterly meeting with our sponsors. And one of the things, one of the positive things um, that we were hearing, that I was hearing from, you know, the tops of the other, of the other agencies from the commissioner's office is that they really, um, it was, it happened, it was such a seamless transition. Um, and that from, uh, that our designers and our construction managers and our vendors were really going to, uh, at this remotely. And I didn't think it was going to be possible. Um, I thought we would get there, but it would take us several weeks. Um, but really it was amazingly because we needed to, it was within 48 hours that everything, um, that everybody was working remotely uh, and working remotely effectively. Um, and uh, there was a Bloomberg report that came out last week that um, the average person working remotely now puts in an extra three hours a day. And it's true. Um, and it's um, not in the sense that you want the people to work more, but they're, um, they're always accessible. Um, and um, and then working with our architects and all that stuff and really, you know, less time traveling to meetings um, and, and really being there in, the, in present as opposed to, you know, trying to get to 3030, taking the train, the shuttle, get into the office, right, you know, raining out and all that stuff. So, um, but really, it really, um, I, I think it really anchors the team into the discussions and, um, and obviously the various platforms helps helps with that. Um, this is uh, Times Square right before uh, the shutdown and right after. So amazing as far as uh, another one of our um, projects that we work with the commissioner on. Um, uh, I'm sure Eric might be highlighting this and some of the additional security measures, but again, another amazing project that we worked on with Commissioner Peña Mora. Um, we're out there, 40 plus million dollar project, um, not one business. Did we, um, you know, while we were working out there and coordinating the effort, uh, businesses remained open at all times. There was not one uh, safety issue on the, on the job site with our general contractor, Tully, nor with the public, um, our CM, and uh, again, an, another amaz amazing uh, project. So <clears throat> as far as us transitioning, so we had 168 projects, about 150 of those went on pause. Um, through, through the latter part of March. Then we also had, um, we also had a number of our design, we had all of our design contracts. We then had those on pause and I sent notice out to those, uh, to the firms. Um, and that was, uh, you know, obviously due to um, fiscal concerns, we wanted to make sure we had enough money allocated for our COVID responses, for our, for our partners at H&H, &H, for Department of Health and Emergency Management. Um, and uh, we wanted to to make sure that we were protecting the firms themselves. Uh, we didn't want we don't want we didn't want nor do we want firms to be working at risk. We understand there's there's the impact from a schedule perspective, uh, but at the same point we have to make sure that um, that when we restart, that when we do restart, as we will, that we do so sensibly um, and and obviously with a plan. Uh, we were approached as in DDC for, um, for our work over working with uh, health and hospitals and emergency management um, for, for working at two identified spots, which you probably heard about in the news, which is the USTA at Billie Jean King and also at Brooklyn Cruise to build temporary uh, hospital uh, beds there, facilities, and also bring in the staffing. So we, uh, it was over 1,100 uh, beds that we had built um, over at both facilities. 
and I'll let Bridget uh, advance it to come up with, uh, yep, so you can see here as far as the beds, as far as this is Billie Jean King, 470 shelter. This includes the um, intensive care. This originally was non-COVID. It then transitioned within 24 hours to a COVID place, to a COVID hospital. That means that obviously intensive care, bringing in oxygen, everything else into the facility. Um, and changing what was tennis courts into a temporary hospital and all the support that that, you know, showers, everything else that that's needed. We're also brought in and partnered um, through Sullivan Brothers that uh, the commission is aware of um, through C uh, CHS, a medical provider that does work over in Afghanistan and Iraq and, um, and really partnered with them and through Sullivan to then provide the medical teams as well. So within 11 days over at the USTA, we had, um, we had an operational hospital and the first patient was admitted. Uh, work was around the clock. This was overseen by, um, by a DDC team um, and it was uh, extremely rewarding as you could imagine to, uh, to, have, uh, to be able to build a hospital and have our first patient seen in 11, and within 11 days. Um, this is our team there. We have our masks on, some, some gloves there present, um, but a great team there. We also have our work over at Brooklyn Cruise. Um, the, you know, the, we partnered again with uh, emergency management, with EDC, uh, Cruise Ports of America to utilize that space. Um, and that was, um, that started up at the end of March, was uh, completed at the end of April. Um, again, for over 200, and, um, no, that was over 600 beds that was uh, provided over at Brooklyn Cruise. Um, did not have any uh, patients, but they was certainly operational, all the oxygen lines, everything installed. Um, so this is the site that we're also looking at with the Department of Health for uh, potential testing as well. Um, as, as far as us moving forward, so um, a snapshot of our team there. We, as I mentioned, we continue to work with our Department of Health with H and H, as far as other um, areas where both uh, permanent um, testing spaces and also um, temporary, we looked at a number of facilities in New Jersey as well, tented structures, things like that. So we're really embarked on that. We evaluated over 300 sites, and work uh, is literally around the clock for our team. This is all managed in house, um, and then we just we, we recently let out some construction management contracts with CM Build. Um, through the emergency deck. And uh, we're you know, obviously partnering very closely with our colleagues in law and our admin and city hall and everything else. So some of the things that we've learned from a, um, you know, as far as going forward, um, you can click on to the next one, Bridget. Um, as far as, so we have our, our in-house team that's currently looked at some, some of the discussions that we've been having um, so we have these check-ins that we have on a daily basis with our division, with our, with our senior management um, as an agency, and then also within the division. And some of the things that we're looking at is um, really is to, to, to prepare what we believe would be standards and protocols um, and to set those up um, such as, you know, um, HVAC improvements, um, the optimal humidity, uh, somewhere around 40 to 60% is recommended for um, you know, future buildings, uh, hand washing signage, increased ventilation is so, so important. Um, is to really come up with an, an uh, uh, Centers for Active Design. It did a lot uh, recently. There was a talk there, um, AIA as well. Um, there was some recent articles as well within the LA Times um, as far as reducing the restrooms with the doors, self-cleaning rooms, waiting nooks. Um, so whatever our recommendations are from a design and construction standpoint, we want to um, first to put out some ideas and then we would be, be engaging and obviously with Columbia University through this center, through AIA, ASCE, uh, Building Congress, um, ACEC, and really um, come up with, we have our in-house team that's, that's currently working on some of these, these items. Uh, these recommendations, um, and then um, and then we would have that you know the industry feedback within the next several weeks, um, so that way we would have a jump start for when we ultimately you know kick kick off uh, construction again, design what have you, and really that's what we're waiting for. So as the the we're we're immersed now in the emergency programs and projects, um, but certainly we look forward to pivoting back to our um, to our existing program um, and having that continue. 
So we do have um, work that continues as what's deemed essential. Um, we projects payments are continuing there. Obviously, um, there will there is a, currently a delay of approximately 30 days for payments. So instead of being paid within 31 days, that right now it's approximately 58 to 62 days, um, and we see that um, you know that's uh, you know obviously with checks and balances, and we um, and so we continue all the payments. So payments have not stopped. Um, however, we, we did put the pause on our design and, and some of our construction projects in public buildings. Um, we, we are doing in-house design. Um, and when our, our colleague and friends uh, comes on next week, he'll, you know, infrastructure is obviously is all horizontal and a lot, most of their program had conti has continued. Um, ours, we have to, you know, we also look at scope so that way when we do return to work, what's, what type of scope is it? Um, how, do, how are we addressing that in these confined areas with fire alarm, with, um, you know, the ventilation? Um, and I see this, and one of our team members brought this up, how we then changed, you know, had the industry changed after 9-11. We firmly believe that the industry will change here as well from a design standpoint, um, design, you know, from our colleagues in AIA and ACEC, and, and obviously the team that's on the call today. So um, that's um, a little snapshot of as far as, um, you know, our program, what we've been working on during the emergency, and then um, how we really see us moving forward as, uh, as an agency and also as a city. So I'll, I'll open it up to, um, to, uh, to the commissioner and or to uh, Mr. Anderson. I guess I'm, I go next, uh, uh, Tom. Thank you very much for a snapshot of the $8.7 billion program. It's uh, a terrific, uh, a terrific overview. I guess the, uh, the big question on everyone's mind is uh, how will uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, directly affect uh, your program going forward? Do you expect uh, the $8.7 billion um, annual budget, uh, capital budget to go up, go down, or stay the same? So I think this is something that, uh, you know, certainly we, we continue to engage with, uh, with our colleagues at OMB and the mayor's office for, um, you know, the next steps. Um, I do not, um, I, you know, and we're also planning with our sponsors as far as when we do, um, you know, when we do resume, as we will, when we resume our design and our construction work, you know, what, what, what projects, uh, where does it make sense? Um, I think from a design standpoint that it's, that it's straightforward. Uh, one of the things that I should have pointed out is that we've had a, uh, an energy code. Um, there's a new uh, requirements that are, that are, uh, that are you know, starting basically today, May 12th. And so um, this, this then mirrors the energy code improvements and efficiencies for the state. Um, so what became apparent to us, you know, as soon as this happened in March, that we knew that um, we it was really critical for our design team to be working on these um, on these projects that were going to be uh, approaching this uh, this deadline. Um, we then had approval for then kickstarting these designs. We also then got approval for kickstarting the design for um, or continuing the design for those projects that are in construction. Um, and then we also engaged through our emergency, uh, through the emergency deck, a series of on-call design contracts to really help us with DOH and testing sites. So I see this progressing. And then at the same point, the city is then going to be determining um, you know, which, where we are. Um, and I think that goes for the whole city, not necessarily for the industry. I think we will certainly mirror with the state because I know from the governor's statements yesterday, as far as opening up Rochester, Binghamton, Albany yesterday, the construction, I would imagine that when that then comes to New York, that will then follow the same suit or at least the same steps and phases. So uh, we certainly look forward to those, um, to those times and we, we continue to engage with our contractors. Um, I don't expect to, to pick up a phone and say, okay, contractors and design professionals, you know, start up tomorrow morning. Um, we want to be able to work with them to what, what's, what is, what makes sense for them. And obviously for, and it'll, you know, it'll certainly be on a, on a project by project basis of, of, of how that phasing would occur. When you announced uh, the pause, uh, as you call it, in uh, design work, that raised a lot of eyebrows. 
uh, because uh, the, the feeling is we need uh, shovel-ready projects if we're going to get federal money. So are you jeopardizing the city's position uh, to attract uh, federal funding uh, by, uh, by pausing design work? Well, I wouldn't. I, w I wouldn't say that we're that we had certainly had closed it. We we had the pause button. Uh, this is something that we needed to do immediately uh, from discussions. Obviously, we were a lot of concerns about budget um, and what the ultimate needs were. We didn't know how many beds what we were going to be, you know, needing that funding for to build uh, temporary hospital structures and testing sites. Um, and then as um, as the curve obviously is flattening and coming down then the city is, is evaluating uh, next steps from a design standpoint. We fully believe that if there's any federal, um, you know, any of the projects that we're working on now, we're preparing um, as if we are getting uh, federal reimbursement for those, um, which will then free up our capital program, again, bonds and what have you. Um, and we are, the commissioner and I are in fully in alignment with the industry of the sooner we can get back, the better. We just don't know when that's going to be. Um, and another thing is what, um, what I never wanted to do, or obviously the city is to, is to, is to have our, our, uh, our partners within the industry working at risk. Um, never want to have a firm that, um, that we would continue the work. We, we certainly thought it would be better to hit the pause button, um, rather than having work continue where we didn't know, uh, financially about, you know, what the impact would be due to the virus on other programs. Um, but I see this as something that certainly will be addressed, um, you know, as the city reopens and the plans for that to then, um, to then, you know, obviously at those, at these points to then restart the design um, and obviously the construction as well. Do you have a time uh, horizon for pivoting back, as you say, uh, to your um, non regular non-emergency program? Do you, do you think that's a month away or two, three months away? Um, I do not know, and I, I don't, one of the, you know, the discussions are, we always want to be prepared, um, and that, so there's a lot of things that we're doing internally and with our sponsors, um, so we're also, we are evaluating that if we do get the green light on a project by project, as I mentioned, you know, there's a number of projects now that, that I'd be comfortable with saying, okay, this is the date that we could then start up, um, and, you know, without having the testing and things like that. Um, and then the others are, you know, there, you know, if we're working on fire alarm projects or uh, elevator shaft where we're working, the teams are working in a very confined space, I would be very reluctant to start that. Certainly the design, no issue with that, but I would be very reluctant to, um, to engage uh, or to commence construction um, without reviewing um, within the industry what those safety plans will be, what, what are we looking at as far as testing. Are we taking temperature tests for our staff? Obviously making sure that everybody has the PPE on. Um, and I've been going in uh, most days into the city to then check on our teams. Um, you know, my team, our, our contractors, our consultants, making sure that everybody's wearing the PPE and, and this isn't the time to, uh, you know, to, to make any lapses from when it comes from, uh, you know, and also maintain that social distancing. Um, so you can have people that have the masks on, but when you're, um, you know, when you go to the site and, 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 and they're working within a confined area, that's when, uh, you know, that's when we, you know, we need to address those. And, and that's one of the things that we would be looking at. So to answer your question, I don't see it as a, as a, you know, as far as the faucet would be full on that everybody would then be going back. And I think it would be, you know, from a design standpoint, possibly, but, um, from a construction, these are something that we would have to look at. Um, depending on the scope of work um, and making sure that everybody is aware as far as what those, um, the enhanced, you know, call them enhanced safety plans would be and what would be required for those. Uh, thank let, you. Let uh, me, uh, I was funny ask you, let me ask one more yes. question and then back to you. I was just going okay. to say that. Yeah. Um, Tom, when you uh, say a year from now, look back uh, to, to where we are now, what do you think uh, COVID will, will, will have changed the, the, uh, the city's design and construction program the most? I think that's a great, uh, a great question. I think it's going to change with our standards, um, with our, within our designs, uh, obviously for air filtration, things like that. 
um, you know, any of the times that we had in the, you know, you're going back into, you know, studying lessons learned from plagues and things like that. You're always looking at, uh, you know, from a design standpoint, design, design dictates behavior. Um, this is something, again, centers for active design, more staircases, accessibility, signage. Um, I, you know, I would look back at this and say, you know, the improvements that the platforms that were available for us to, you know, for 150 people here to have a, um, you know, this discussion, I think is, is amazing. Um, and I wouldn't have thought that this was, you know, I'm not in the Zoom world. Um, nor in the team's world, but I think that uh, having the technology and things like that, um, you know, has, has, been, has been amazing. Um, but I really think that a year from now, looking back, it'll be, um, you know, it'll be from a design standpoint, um, as far as, you know, how we're laying out a facility, a community room. You know, we're building, we're designing community rooms in all our, most of our, our buildings, you know, whether that's for the borough-based jails, whether that's for police stations, our um, Department of Health, um, we're proceeding with the four critical facilities, our animal shelters, but even, with the, even within those areas, what does, that, what does that room look like? What do those rooms look like? Um, so that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the open space has been redefined. You know, certainly there's been a lot of uh, discussions of that in the past couple of years, and I think that if anything, that's gonna f further accelerate you know, what those, what those mean as far as a waiting room, the nooks and things like that. So, um, but really interesting articles coming out of, um, you know, uh, AIA, you again, what have you. Sorry, Finjewski. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom, again, wonderful presentation and big, uh, very important questions and particularly looking at the future. I have some, Kind of more detailed questions uh, that we received from the audience, um, and they are kind of three groups. One is the borough-based jail, um, you know, that has been put in pause. There are some questions about it. When do you think that that project that was considered to be high priority, there is a, a state law that says that, um, you know, the residents of Rikers have to be moved out by 2026, and how this COVID-19 pause is affecting those plans? What are the discussions? And particularly, when do you think that that particular program will be uh, on pause? So um, we, we continue. Um, so I, we have our in-house resources that we, we're continuing with that. We're continuing with the, the RFQ for the, the Queens Garage. We did put a pause on our construction manager, um, uh, as far as a program manager, I should say. Um, for the design build, I actually had a discussions with DBIA this morning concerning the program. Um, f remain fully engaged with us um, as far as the next steps. So, um, but I think that you know the this will tie in as well to um, the city resuming normalcy um, as far as getting the bids out there um, and making sure that you know we could do so much via Zoom and all that stuff. And but I do think that there would be challenges with continuing an RFP process and the partnerships that we need in the design build platform um, via Zoom or via Teams um, because there's a lot of confidential information. So that, those are some things that we're looking at and they, they really need to be in-person engagement. Um, and then what are we looking at for in, in that regard? So a lot of those discussions and a lot of that will also, you know, that will then resume when the city um, goes back to some sense of normalcy. Oh, th thank you, Tom. And another question is about the design requirement contracts. Um, one of the participants asked the question that um, several months ago, you issued like kind of an RFP for the design requirement contracts of uh, design uh, firms of different size. Um, they want to know if there is um, any revised schedule about that uh, uh, in terms of what they should be expecting. Yes, thank you. Um, and this is something that I should have noted, but um, we're hoping to release. And this is this is another, I think this is a perfect time for us to show that the city is back in business and releasing an RFP um, because there's so much time that obviously for, um, for to review the, obviously to prepare the proposals to review them. So we should be releasing these shortly in the sense that it will be in the, it'll be um, within the next, I would say within the next 60 days that we will be releasing our on-call design contracts, small, medium, and large. And then we will be following that up in the summer with our construction manager managers as well, um, our CM contracts. But 
all basically all of our on call contracts we and this MEP and all the whole the whole gauntlet of our on call contracts we will be releasing um, I would say within the next several months all of the all of them starting off with the design small medium and large within 60 days and then follow up with CM and then uh, mechanical electrical plumbing and what have you so super super exciting for that and I think that that's something as that time frame gets further um, once we have more of an idea as far as the time frame that we would look for something uh, you know coming out from Commissioner Grillo to the industry on that. Oh. Thank you, Tom. Um, the last question that I'm going to ask from the participants is that, you know, this uh, pandemic and the um, New York pause have affected um, a lot of businesses, but particularly smaller businesses, smaller consulting firms that provide services to uh, capital project agencies like DDC. Um, are there any plans to develop uh, programs to support those small businesses when things restart? Um, I know that uh, the uh, governor signed the um, for MWBE uh, different types of um, kind of programs to help them and and the mentoring program. But I don't know if there are any discussion. Uh, that's what what one of the participants want to ask for the small businesses in general. Yeah. So one of the um, one of the items that came up as far as our our any of the any of the vendors that are working with us now in our MWBE those payments will be processed immediately. Uh, they will not be waiting that, that 60, 62 days. So those payments go in immediately and they're processed. We're also working um, as part of our emergency program um, to help define a lot of the times, obviously an emergency program, you don't, you're not, you know, don't have the, uh, the requirements um, for MWBEs. Um, and this is something that we're, we're really happy. We just awarded a, uh, a, a contract to an MWBE that's part of our emergency program. Um, there'll be several more of these contracts coming out. So certainly continue to monitor our website, what have you. Um, but, and I also expect that when, when we re do resume and any of the changes that will be coming out for the, um, as far as small business MWB, that'll be announced by Commissioner Grillo and Maggie Austin, our, our Chief Diversity Officer um, and Industry Specialist of Relations. So, um, but I think those there'll be exciting things coming up, and and I and I know that that'll be part of the program. But if there are any payments out now, that um they're they're being uh, expedited um, with collaboration from the mayor's office and OMB. Oh, thank you. And I just want to thank Tom for uh, taking time from your very busy schedule to talk to us. Thank you to all the participants that have. Uh, uh, join us, uh, Dick Anderson, for uh, being the co-moderator and asking very insightful questions, not only about the present, but the future. But I also want to thank some of our partners, collaborator organizations. I know that Wayne Crew from the National Academy of Construction is, uh, is uh, on the line. Uh, Jan Touchman from ENR in the New News Records and Kim Yao from the AIA New York, they are all here. And I would like to mention to all the participants that the next installment of this series is going to be next week. Uh, Tom mentioned a couple of times, the speaker is going to be Eric McFarlane, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Infrastructure for um, uh, DDC. And the co-moderator will be Jan Touchman, the uh, Chief uh, uh, Editor uh, for uh, Engineering News Record. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next week. And Tom, thank you for participating. Um, I would like to say thank you to Dick, uh, as well as Bridget for helping us, uh, Michael Smith, uh, the technology person from Colombia that have made this all possible. So uh, as well as uh, Rick Bell and Charles Chen from the Center uh, for buildings, infrastructure, and public space. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, all. Be thank safe. You. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.